This is C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. This week, Senator Patrick Leahy, Democrat from Vermont, discusses his book, The Road Taken. He reflects on his nearly 50 years in the U.S. Senate and some of the legislation he has worked on. If we don't, if we start putting limits on education so you can only know certain things, limits uh, on what reporters can honestly say, whether we may disagree with them or not. If we put limits on all this, if we don't study what's going on, yes, I, I really fear for democracy. He's interviewed by USA Today Bureau Chief Susan Page. Senator Patrick Leahy, you're doing something that is hard for a lot of senators to do, and that is to retire voluntarily. What well, made you decide to do that? Well, I never thought I was going to be here this long. You know, I'm the only Democrat elected in Vermont history, the youngest one at the time. And everybody said I'd be a one-term senator. And I thought that was quite possible. But then it got a little bit easier getting reelected. I did not expect to be here this long. And my wife, Marcel, and I talked about it right after the last election. And we pretty firmly said that'd be the last one. I knew from the polls and everything else, I could easily be reelected this year. But I'm 82. We wanted to go home. I wanted to have more time with kids and our grandkids. We both like to scuba dive. We have more time for that. Uh, But also, it's time for somebody else to come in there. And I wanted to uh, be able to do things with a University of Vermont and other places, tell people, What's happened in the last half century? You know, you're you are not, in fact, the you're the present pro tem of the Senate, but you are not the oldest uh, senator. Uh, There are four others who are older than you. Senator Feinstein is 89. She was just elected to another term. Senator Grassley is 88. He's in the middle of uh, a reelection campaign. Why is it so hard for so many senators to do what you have decided to do? Well. Each one has to answer their, their own reasons. Uh, of course, I, I've served there with 400, approximately 400 of the 1,900 senators who've been here in the history of the country. Uh, some were there only for a week or two, filling in a, another term. Others planned to stay a long time, but the electorate decided otherwise. Vermont's a very special state. I mean, I can go home. People call me my first name. I, I recognize people I've known all my life. And I think I've done all I can uh, for Vermont. I've been through tumultuous times in the Senate. And I just, I wanted to go when I was at, the, I wanted to leave when I was at the top uh, of my career. And I wanted to be, be remembered for that. And, you know, my wife and I want to have more time for ourselves. We've been married 60 years. I want to enjoy the, the, the last years. Just one last question on this. The average age of the Senate at the start of this session was 64.3 years old, which is an age where in most professions you are hanging it up. Is it a, is it, is it a good thing that the average age of the Senate is there? Well, when, when I first came there, uh, I was the second youngest. I was 34. The youngest was Joe Biden. And they called Joe and myself the kids. And uh, I remember one very senior senator saying to me, boy, how old are you? And I said, well, 34. Anybody ever tell you you're too young to be in the United States Senate? I, I got my temper up a little bit. I said, yeah, my opponent for one. He loved it because I didn't back down, and, and we got along well after that. But, uh, yeah, I looked at a number of people, and I thought, who are those old people? I mean, they were in their 50s. And I since learned each senator is different. They bring different things to the uh, Senate. What disturbs me, though, the Senate was, although imperfectly, could be considered the conscience of the nation. 
Obviously, that conscience was violated during segregation and all that. But senators of both parties would try to work out what's best for the nation, what's not best for uh, that evening's headlines. Or in today, what's next on, on social media? And I've seen that fall apart. And, and that's why I decided if I was leaving, I was going to write a book about what I hoped was the good and the bad of, of the Senate. So which senator was it who asked, told you that, uh, did anyone ever tell you you were too young to be a U.S. senator? I don't think I identified there, but it was Jim Eastland, <laughs> who was the dean of the Senate, the president pro tempore, and I thought, my God, I'll never be around here long enough to be the dean of the Senate and president pro tempore, so sorry about that, Jim. <laughs> Here's what you write in the, in the epilogue of your book. You say, the Senate is a broken place. Our institutions are not what Mike Mansfield and Hugh Scott and Jerry Ford and Hubert Humphrey and Ted Kennedy and John Stennis and Barry Goldwater knew them to be. Some of that change is good. A lot of it is tragic, and all of it is simply is what it is. You can point fingers or you can point the way forward to something better. Some of that change is good. What is the change that you've seen in the Senate that you think is good? Well, I think there's more uh, transparency in the Senate, which I think is good. I, uh, I remember the debate over having television in the uh in the Senate and televising hearings and all that. Well, today, of course, with the ability to do that, uh, it's much easier to get this out on the platform. Some who are opposed to it it bring about some grandstanding, and it did. But there was grandstanding before. Now, some of the people who do the grandstanding, uh, it's obvious to the public and hopefully... Uh, it gets the debate going. You know, I, I was a uh, in law school, Georgetown Law, Law, which at that time had the law school right down just uh, two or three blocks from the Capitol. I used to walk up the hill. I'd walk through it. That, and you'd have to look around to try to find a police officer to ask directions. You'd just walk in and sit there. I was fascinated by the real debates that were going on. There are far less of those real debates. And that that has hurt the Senate and that's hurt the country. Um, it I never thought I'd be there. I didn't realize that uh, 10 years or so later I was going to be in the Senate. You say a lot of the change is tragic. Yeah. What would you say is tragic about the changes in the Senate? The... The influence of special interest money, and I, I could say it to the right or the left, single issue groups, the money they pour in there, um, it, and people are feeling, well, I got to follow this mandate or that mandate. It's a six year term. If you can't follow your conscience, go find another job, uh, do something else. And if you feel you've got to respond to whichever single issue or special interest group that's backing you, you shouldn't be in the Senate. You're not helping the country. And I give an example. When Richard Nixon uh, resigned, it was after a meeting of some of the most conservative Republicans, Barry Goldwater, Hugh Scott, the Republican leader, going down, not with any joy in their heart, but a sense of duty and telling Richard Nixon he had to leave. I remember talking with both Senator Scott and Senator Goldwater about that. They said they were just heavy-hearted doing it. They knew that it meant their party was losing its president, and uh, but it was the only thing that could be done and should be done. And in fact, when they were asked, by the press command said, well, we had, we had a conversation with the president. 
listening to them in quiet uh, cloakroom discussions, I, I realized how heavily it weighed on them. But they both told me there's nothing else we could do. If, if we showed our duty as, first of all, senators, Republicans next, but first as senators, we had to go down and tell Richard Nixon that. Contrast that, if you would, with the experience that we've seen most recently with President Trump um, and his two impeachment trials, one of which you, you presided over. How would you compare and contrast that with the Nixon experience? Oh, I, I, it's night and day. Uh, I know a number of senators have told me, yes, he's guilty, but he's not going to be convicted, so I'm not going to vote for his conviction because I'm up the next year or the next time or, or whatever. That shouldn't be the, the case. Uh, those who were before the January 6th insurrection are strongly supporting him. They just try to do it quietly and support him so as not to get his anger, but they were willing to not do what they thought was right. And the I, I, I quote a, an Irish parliamentarian who said you, you owe your uh, vigilance and your duty to help your constituents, but your conscience is your own, and you don't owe that to anybody else. I've always found that vote your conscience. You might catch a lot of grief from one side or the other, but do it. One of the things that some people have, some senators have talked about uh, these days is ending the filibuster. Do you think that would make sense? Well, when I first came there, I worked with uh, then-Senator Fritz Mondale, and we dramatically uh, lowered the number of people who could uh, uh, filibuster. And at that time, we had major issues. People actually came on the floor and debated them. And instead of just saying, oh, I, I object, goodbye, I got a TV interview to do. Nothing against mm -hmm. TV interviews. But, uh, and we might have one or two a year. Now, I don't know how many we've had already this year. It's been dozens and dozens. Uh, we, we're voting every week to uh, overcome mostly on the nomination of a judge. Uh, that's That makes no sense. And whichever party benefits by it, I think that has to end. And I, I don't mind having long debates on things, provided you're there debating, not calling to the cloakroom and say, hey, have somebody put an objection for me. Baloney. Be on, be on the floor, talk about why you're objecting, and stand up for it. And I think if people had to do that, whether we change the rules or not, there'd be a lot less filibusters. So a standing filibuster that, where you have to actually yeah. be on the scene and talking. Yes, and, and even then I think I would set a limitation on time. Yeah. Senator Lee, tell me about your parents. Oh, they're wonderful people. My mother was a first-generation Italian-American. My grandparents had emigrated from northern Italy. My grandfather was a stone carver. She was born in a small town in Vermont, first language Italian. My uh, father, obviously Irish for the name, and born in Barrie, Vermont, where uh, my grandfather, I never knew, was also a stone carver and died of silicosis of the lungs. I, I'm named after him. And they, they had been there uh, in the 1800s also as Irish immigrants. And they both had brought a great sense of history, a sense of what the country should be, a loyalty to the country, a respect for the country, even though growing up they were very, very much in the minority as uh, uh, as Democrats, as Catholics, Irish, Italian. Uh, but they saw the evolution, and they insisted that we children, 
that my brother and sister uh, study history and do our best. I became the, the first Leahy uh, to get a college degree. My sister was the second. And how proud my parents were of that. But they, we would sit around, we'd read the Sunday papers. We'd talk. I had my first library card when I was four years old. Uh, but it was all the encouragement of my parents, who were avid readers, uh, avid readers. And my father, who had to leave school in his early teens to support his mother after my grandfather died, he was such a student of history that our kids, when they were in college and had a history exam, let's call Grandpa Leahy and double-check our answers. And he had a his company called the Leahy Press. That's what was right. the Leahy Press? It was a printing business. My parents had first a, a weekly newspaper in Waterbury, which they sold, and then started this uh, printing business in Montpelier, right on State Street in the back of our house. Uh, and we're a block away from the state capitol, which we could see from our, our front steps. And... They, um, but they built that up, and it, the Lady Press still exists. It's not in our family. They, they sold it. My father had been a, uh, a printer in another printing business, and he was the best printer. And they wanted to, he wanted to be promoted. And they said, "Well, we can't. Uh, you're Irish and Catholic." So he started his own business. Uh, Five years later, the other business folded, and his was still going at the time he retired in his 80s. You could see the state capitol from your, from your oh. home. And in fact, in your book, you tell a story, <laughs> which is very hard to believe. Tell me if this is actually true, that at six years old, you pedaled your tricycle into the governor's office. What happened? Well, I, one of my buddies were, and I were used to going up there and We'd sit on the cannons out front and walk around. Doors were open. Uh, half the time it was empty. Part -time, we had a part-time governor, and the legislature wasn't saying much of the year, so we'd walk around there. So one day we got the idea. We dragged her up to the second floor of our, our um, tricycles and said, let's race. So we were roaring down. There's an open door at the end of the long hallway, was the governor's office. We didn't know that. We came rushing through, wham up against this desk. And I remember uh, I felt the desk was 20 feet high at that age. And I looked over and said, yes. I said, oh, are you the governor? He said, yes, now get out. But he did give us some candy on the way out. Well, we went home and so proud to tell uh, parents about it. They did not see the humor in the situation. And I was told that no more tricycle riding in the Capitol. I could go in the Capitol with our parents, but uh, show some decorum. You, uh, you thought about... I, I still get teased by the current governor. Every time I come in the, uh, uh, his office, he says, different desk, Patrick, different desk. <laughs> you, uh, you thought about running for governor of Vermont in 1972, but instead... You waited and ran for the Senate in 1974. Why the Senate rather than running for governor? A new governor would be temporary. I had always talked on our first date. I told myself, and we were teenagers, she said, what are you going to do when you're older? I want to be governor. She's like, oh, that's nice. Uh, but I, uh, we had very young children. It would have been very difficult with that young family uh, to run for governor, and I didn't. But I kept thinking about it, and I said, why don't I go to what I really want, run for uh, the Senate? And I did. Uh, it was sort of like, okay, kid, you, you can have the nomination. No, it's not worth anything. We were the only state in the union that never elected anybody under 50 and never elected a... Uh, uh, a Democrat, and I was 34, and um, uh, but we campaigned heavily. I 
it kept only two headlines from that time. One was five days, in a very influential paper, it was five days before the election. It said, big, bold type, poll, dooms, Leahy. <laughs> it's an uncomfortable weekend. Then five days later, Leahy unexpectedly <laughs> wins. And I thought, okay, not as important as Truman and Dewey, but that's my, that's my small town equivalent of that uh, uh, headline. Do you have that paper? Oh, I do. Yeah. yeah, that's the only thing uh, a, a newspaper about me that I actually framed and put in my office. In that first Senate race, there was a third party candidate, a Liberty Union Party candidate, whose name was Bernie Sanders. I remember him. <laughs> what was Bernie Sanders like then? Well, we got along well, but he was, uh, the speeches you hear today were uh, speeches you heard then. And, and it showed his passion and his commitment in these areas. I asked him why he uh, was running, because he'd obviously be taking votes from me. He said, well, everybody knows you can't win anyway, and I can use this to get known. Um, I've always had third and fourth party opponents in my races. Uh, my second race having won nearly cost me the election. Since then, they, it's been uh, 1 or 2 percent of the vote. Yeah, in 1980, you had a close call. You won by 2,700 votes. And in your book, you write, I was angry that the vase had gotten this tight and mad at myself for forgetting how I'd been elected in the first place. How, how did you have been elected in the first place? What was it that you had forgotten? Be, be myself. Uh, you know, I've been a prosecutor for... Uh, for a number of years, I tried a lot of cases, murder cases, and everything else, and argued more cases in the Vermont Supreme Court than any law firm in the in the state at that time. And so I was known for that, but I was known for being myself. In the first re-election, uh, Democratic Party, and I can understand why I thought, God, we never counted on having a uh, Democrat from Vermont, we got to train this guy what to say and all, and be senatorial, be above the the fray. And as Marcel and I went around the state, we could see. Well, I'll give you one example: is a, a factory where I would stop in at least once a year at, as they're coming through. Uh, uh, workers go through just to say hi. And this time I was there, and they'd always supported me. And I said, well, now I need your vote. We'll be voting. And it was a cold day, and suddenly I felt the temperature drop 30 degrees. And they said, well, you're, you're, you're certainly ahead. I said, no, I'm not. We took another poll, and I wasn't. I was well behind my opponent. We were going to have a major debate at that time being watched by, uh, throughout the state. And Marcel said, stop being above the fray. Stop using the talking points. Just be yourself. Say what you think. You know, you were a trial lawyer. You've done. You've run campaigns. So I did. And it made a big difference. Uh, and people reacted. It was just two or three weeks before the election. And you felt the tide turn. But we campaigned literally until the polls closed. You were a member of the Watergate Babies class, elected in 1974, just after President Nixon had resigned in disgrace. In that election, Democrats picked up 49 seats in the House and five in the Senate. You are the last one in office from that group. What is the legacy of the Watergate Babies class? Well, I think we brought in the fact that we've got to have more open debates. We started... uh, we sort of stopped the idea that you got to be there two or three years and sit quietly in the back row, but actually get involved. I mean, in my case, uh, the Vietnam War was still going on. It was a, it was actually popular in Vermont. The majority, our newspapers supported it. Uh, no Vermont member of the House or Senate 
had actually voted to end the war. They had criticized it, but they would always vote for it for continuing uh, money for it. I was temporarily on the Armed Services Committee. We are going to have a vote to reauthorize the war. We had five votes. Each one lost by one vote. I was the newest member, and I, I could feel the pressure. Each time I voted no. I was told by the editor of one of our newspapers he'd make sure I was a one term senator because of that. And I was getting calls from the President Ford, uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, Jim Schlesinger, and all those. And I said, no, this is the way I'm going to vote. And we finally, uh, I remember John Sennett, the chair of the committee, after the fifth vote, he realized he couldn't pass, turned the staff members said, I think we better get the president on the phone. He'll want to know this. Now, we would have, the war would have ended disastrously as it was. You remember the pictures of uh, the helicopters taking off from our embassy in, in Saigon. I've visited that embassy since. And I knew I'd catch hell from. Uh, some of these newspapers back home. But what Marcel and I found, we had people come up to us quietly in the grocery store or coming out of church and just go, thank you, thank you. In 48 years in office, what's been the hardest single vote to cast? Well, that that one was difficult. Not, I mean, I <laughs> thought it was with the right vote. But I knew that politically I, I'd catch heck for it. I've had some votes where, uh, well, for example, I, I was proud to vote for John Roberts as chief justice because I did not want, even though we're different philosophically, I did not want the chief justice of the United States to be confirmed on a party line vote. And uh, it was a difficult vote because I, I probably would have, if we had a Democratic president at the time, it would have recommended somebody else uh, for chief justice. But I felt that, and still do, that he's an honest man and qualified. We're different philosophically, and I voted for him. That, uh, there was some blowback on that, but I felt comfortable. In every one of these things, I'll say to myself, what does my conscience say? Now, sometimes I knew I went against uh, majority views, but I also knew that I was right. And in a lot of them, people told me after, for example, the Iraq war, I was one of the few that voted against it. And after it, a lot of people said, boy, we wish we had. But I actually knew the intelligence and studied it and knew there were no weapons of mass destruction and knew this was just a, a rush to judgment. 48 years, you've done many things you're proud of, but if you're, one of your grandkids came to you and said, what, this, what are you proudest of that you have achieved during your time in the Senate? What would you tell them? That I helped a lot of people that wouldn't have been helped otherwise. I, I expanded the uh, school lunch and school breakfast program uh, help farmers who wanted to uh, do organic farming, and then helped war victims around the world uh, who who had a uh, lost their limbs, uh, sometimes from our weapons, and started a war victims fund, used all over the world, uh, helping people, and you know there. In fact, I keep over my desk what I call a conscience picture. Which is a conscience picture which we, we actually, I noticed in the book uh, that uh, you reproduce in, in your book. Tell us about this picture. I, I, I do a lot of photography, and I was in a, uh, in a refugee camp in Central America during one of the wars there. And I asked people through the translator if I could take their pictures. And 
They did, and this man just looked at me as I took his picture. When I developed the film, I, I, I look at it, and I, he's saying to me, I can never do anything to help you. Uh, I'll never be able to. What do you do to help people like me? And I've, that's been hanging over my desk ever since. And I call it a conscience picture. And that I'd add to what I'd tell my grandchildren. Follow your conscience. Follow your conscience. There's a second photo I'd like to talk about. It's also one that you took, one that you took in Tibet. Tell us about that photo. Well, the, um, I'd wanted to go to Tibet and for two or three years negotiated with the Chinese to bring a congressional delegation, a bipartisan congressional delegation there. At that time, there was such a crackdown by the Chinese on uh, the Tibetans. If somebody was seen with a picture or anything of the Dalai Lama, uh, they could be arrested. And I'm walking through like a, I don't know, junkyard, but something like that. This man was holding a child. I was walking with Senator Stafford, who's about my height, over six feet tall, and a staff person. Uh, and we're blocking the view of these small, much smaller uh, secret police, Chinese secret police following it. And he held up the uh, picture. Dalai Lama pointed at my camera. I assumed he meant, don't take my pictures. He wanted to take it, so I went click like and kept going. It was film, I had no idea when it came out. One of the, the, the person with us went back, spoke the language, and said, why did you risk prison? This man said, because they have to know. A week or two after we got back, uh, I had the pictures all printed up. The Dalai Lama was in town. I knew him. He came over and sat and looked at pictures from there, from the Portala where he had his fled and, and all. Uh, with with my son and I, we just sat around a coffee table looking at him. And I handed him that picture, told him the story. He just looked at it. A tear came down his face. And I thought, you know, uh, this is history, not history that I'm making, but it's reflecting the history of the suppression of a religion. And I couldn't help but think, uh, my family, uh, everybody should be allowed to practice religion, any religion they want. Uh, it's like their commitment to the First Amendment. Say anything, you be able to speak your mind on anything. Practice any religion you want, or none if you want. Uh, that gives you freedom. And I couldn't help but think of my parents watching His Holiness react to that picture. We talked about <clears throat> your toughest votes, the thing you're proudest of. Is there, with the benefit of some hindsight, is there something you rue about uh, your work in the Senate, something that you regret a mistake, misstep or a mistake or a vote you wish you could change? Well, I've cast over 17,000 votes, most of anybody there. Uh, I'm sure I could go back to and find some, say, in hindsight, what was I thinking? And, you know, I've acknowledged that on, on some. I, uh, I, I've sometimes felt... I hadn't pressed hard enough to protect uh, people's freedoms on things. Uh, but the issue comes up again, and you can. But then I'm proud of things like right, right after 9 11, uh, Attorney General Ashcroft and the Bush administration wanted to immediately change a lot of our laws, which would have limited speech and people's rights in this country. And I said, no. We're going to take a closer look at this. And I was pleased a number of Republicans joined me. Quietly, but joined me. Now you had a, uh, you're known as being uh, blunt spoken. Uh, so is Dick Cheney. Um, there was a time. <laughs> I know what you're going to. 
There was a time uh, that he was on the Hill when he was vice president talking to Republicans. Uh, you went over and asked him to come over and talk to the Democrats. He was, I think, angry that you had been criticizing Halliburton, the company I, I that he had formerly been. left. Yes. And he told you a phrase we can't repeat on C-SPAN, uh, a vulgar phrase about what you should do with yourself. Tell us about that. Were you surprised when he, when he said I, that? I was. You know, I, I, I'd known him. I had known him before he was vice president. And uh, I was I was surprised at that, and it uh, I never said a word about it. It was the Republicans who were standing there were so shocked at it. Uh, they didn't agree with him doing that. A lot of them would like to have seen him do as other vice presidents have in both parties. You know, go back and forth to the floor, and uh, they, they told the press about it. So. Um, the uh, uh, I was up for re-election that year. Somebody came up with the idea to have T-shirts that annoy Cheney, vote Leahy, <laughs> and uh, Doonesbury, uh, Gary Trudeau had six uh, six days of cartoons about it, and we got his permission to have one of the panels on the shirt. They sold out immediately. We had to. We do them over and over again. They still show up uh, around the country. But then, uh, you remember Dick Cheney had uh, been down in in Texas on a hunting trip and accidentally shot a friend of his in the face. I was in uh, in Texas about two weeks later with our, our son, who was a pilot, who was down there. We'd gone for a run out on the... A desert. I had tripped, fell, broke my glasses, scraped the heck out of my face. Two days later, we had a joint meeting of the House and Senate, so the vice president comes and I was marching over with him. He says, Pat, what happened to you? I said, well, Dick, over the weekend I was in Texas. He said, I wasn't there. I wasn't there. And, you know, it, uh, uh, it was a way of saying, okay, let's be ourselves again. You uh, you were president pro tem of the Senate from 2012 to 2015, and again since 2021. What is that? Well, it's the uh, usually goes the senior most member of the uh, majority party. In my case, I was the senior most member of either party. But when the Democrats were there, I became uh, well. When and in a way died, I became. President pro tem the next day, it makes you third in line to the presidency. And I've told uh, President Biden asked me how I felt about that, being third in line. I said, well, I always prayed for your safety before. I pray twice as hard now. Uh, but those of us who were here at the time, I was a law student, when President Kennedy was shot, and we saw it. You had a vice president, but then it was not quite sure what the line of succession was after them. So now we have the uh, vice president, the, the speaker, and myself. And then it'll go to uh, members of the cabinet. Just think, though, if you had to use that, I mean, I, I pray nobody would have to because it means we've had some enormous attack on the United States, some tragic thing, if the president, vice president, speaker of either party uh, was wiped out. So, um, but it's there, and I... Uh, but, but it also, as uh, President Pro Tem, I can take the chair anytime I want unless the vice president wants it. And uh, she normally doesn't, unless it's for a tie vote. And I enjoy presiding over the Senate. And uh, But I, I enjoy the fact that having come to the Senate as the junior most member of the Senate, and with the, as a, we talked about before, boy, how old are you, uh, to being the senior most member of the Senate. I, I've always wondered, when you become president pro tem, since unlikely that you would succeed to the presidency, but 
uh, not impossible. Do, do you get any like special training? Are there any special perks because you're in that line of succession? Well, I... I say, how careful I say, I have a, if there was to be, something had to be, there's a code I use when called and I'm asked the question, are you prepared to take the oath? That I think about very seriously and I have around the clock protection. But other than that, no, no particular preparation other than the fact that I have access to just about any of our classified yeah. material. But then I would as uh, chair of a appropriations, as does the majority and minority leader. But not not to get involved in things that should be kept secret, but there's a code where someone would call you and let you know that your time was there. Yeah. That must have been pretty sobering when they told you about that. Well, when I, yeah, and I, I carry... Well, I carry something so I can respond. Mm -hmm. Wow. Let's talk about January 6th and the assault on the Capitol. Where were you? I was on the Senate floor. Uh, You know, we were going back and forth, uh, which has been routine to me after all the time I've been there. You go over to the House and uh, they've counted the electoral votes and, and... you have certain motions made there, and you have certain motions back in the, the uh, Senate, or vice versa, depending on what, what the motions were. And the vice president presides. I remember Al Gore, even though he felt he had won, de- declaring George Bush as president, and how difficult that, that must be. Uh, but this was so different, you had some posturing for the cameras that they contest that. And and, all, and we were in the uh, Senate chamber, all of us were there. And suddenly uh, Secret Service officers came rushing into the, uh, into the chamber. Now, I have armed security with me, but they stop at the door when I get there. They're right outside the door, but they don't, don't go in. The uh, Secret Service doesn't go in. They came in. They rushed Mike Pence off the chair. Uh, the Republican president pro tem at that time it was going to be that for another few days. He got started getting the chair, and then uh, another police officer comes in, takes the microphone, and says, we got to get out of here. And I look beside me, and here's... Uh, a police officer carrying a machine gun. And I, I said, what's going on? He said, we got to evacuate you. And we evacuated down the back steps. Uh, I was born blind in one eye, so I have a depth perception problem. And I, to this day, I remember a full battle gear, a police officer coming up to me and taking my arm, saying, don't worry, Shamrock, I'll, I'll walk with you. Shamrock was a cold name they gave me as President Pro Tem, and he'd been on the detail once, knew of my depth perception. We walked to a secure room, and we're all, what's going on? We finally got a TV uh, TV sets turned on. We could watch it live, as you recall. And somebody said, uh, and, and we didn't know what was the condition of the chamber, uh, whether there were bombs or anything else around. And somebody said, well, we can vote to meet as a Senate here. And I stood up and I said, no. I, I said, I'm the dean of the Senate. I don't want to be hidden away from the American public. If we have to wait till midnight uh, for them to clear the chamber, we should go back and let the American public see us all and what we're doing. I got applause from both Republicans and Democrats, especially some of the newer members. So that's right, we'll just wait here. And we did, and we marched back in, and uh, you could smell the uh, tear gas, the floor is slippery outside from uh, uh, from the fire extinguishers. I have an office right outside the uh, 
floor. Actually, it's, it's next to where the speaker's office is on the front of the Capitol. And I knew the door was unlocked, but I thought I was going to be back in a minute. I had some trepidation going there because I'd seen the people smashing her office. I mean, less than 20 feet from mine. My door was open. I, I, I have in there pictures of my family, and personal things. Nothing had been touched. They went right by my office and went to the speakers. Amazing. You write about uh, when you were in the secure location waiting to go back. What time did the Senate get back into the chamber? Uh, I'd have to go back and check by early, by early afternoon. Yeah. So here's what you write while you're in the secure location and we're watching this terrible scene unfold in the Capitol. You say, Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley, two other senators, were deep in nervous conversation with each other. I wondered whether it was sinking in that their orchestrated stunt played a role in all too real consequences. They looked like the dogs who had caught the car, these two Ivy League educated elites who had tried to reinvent themselves as Trump era populist defenders against the stolen election. Have you seen um, the tactics and behavior of Senator Cruz and Senator Hawley change since January 6th? Not not really, briefly, but not really. I remember uh, Senator Cruz standing in a posture in the House saying, I contest this, or whatever the words were he used, and having an appropriate number of House members who would uh, support him. Uh, we knew uh, Senator Hawley, they have pictures of him giving a salute to the... Uh, demonstrators, and then shortly thereafter we realized the demonstration was running up the uh, steps to the security of the police. Um, that is not the way I'd want a senator to be. Uh, and I don't care whether it's a Democrat or Republican. And interestingly enough, in that closed meeting, when I talked about um, we got to go back on the floor and, sh and let the American people see where we stand. We had a couple of senators who were going and originally planned to file uh, objections to the electoral count and said, we're not, we're not, we're not going to do that. Uh, I think they realized this has gotten so out of hand. Nobody, uh, you know, when we were in the secure air, they were showing some of the pictures that we hadn't seen. Uh, Donald Trump saying, should march on the Capitol and I'll be there with you. Uh, take back our country. Well, one, he wasn't going to be there with them. Uh, and secondly, a lot of these people, especially now as you see the emails they were sending, uh, people that are armed, uh, who want to take back the the Capitol and felt they had been given a blessing by the President of the United States to storm the Capitol. Some came rushing. We have a right to be here. The Constitution allows us to take over. Well, they've never read the Constitution. And of course, there's nothing in the Constitution that allows that. But I think we began to realize just how much uh, the then President his words had incited this, whether he intended the destruction of the Capitol or not, that's something only he could answer. But the words certainly did. After January 6th, and in the wake of these efforts to overturn the results of the, of the 2020 election with the false charges that it was a stolen election, do you think our democracy is in some peril now? Yes. Yes, and I say that unequivocally. And that's why uh, I had this book pretty well finished. You know, I have notes that I've taken almost daily for 48 years and probably got through that finish, and January 6th happened. And we delayed it to talk about my worries. 
if we don't, if we start putting limits on education so you can only know certain things, limits uh, on what reporters can honestly say, whether we may disagree with them or not, if we put limits on all this, if we don't study what's going on, yes, I, I really fear for democracy. Have you ever felt that way before? No. And uh, remember, I was there right after Watergate, uh, there for the wrap-up of the Vietnam War, Vietnam now an ally, and I and plays in my role in, in trying to bring that about. Uh, I worried about the bombing in, in Oklahoma City, certainly 9-11, but we came together as, as a democracy. Made some mistakes afterward, but we came together. Now, uh, when I see some of the things online, people questioning, well, Joe Biden was never elected. He got five million more votes than Donald Trump, four or five million, whatever the number was, and more electoral votes. I do worry. What should Americans do? Step back, take a, a deep breath. Um, there are very, very good people, Republicans and Democrats. Urge them to, to speak first and foremost what's best for the country. Uh, we're seeing the Supreme Court becoming politicized and Supreme Court members bragging about taking a, a political role. That hurts, that hurts us. We've got to have some bodies where you can agree or disagree on something but feel they're doing what they think is right. We don't see enough of that today. And there are some very good senators, both Republicans and Democrats, some far more conservative than I, some more liberal than I, but I, I trust they're doing what they feel is right. Others seem to be wanting to follow uh, what is popular at the moment, and that's going to hurt the country. You've served with nine presidents and observed them close up, so I'd like to do a lightning round where I'm going to name the president, and you just give a couple words that come to your mind when you think of them, uh, two or three words, an adjective, a verb, whatever. Gerald Ford. A lot brighter than I expected and one of the most down-to-earth people I know. Jimmy Carter. Uh, if, if he felt you were, could be somebody he could trust, it's very good. He, he understood our family and all that. Uh, had some difficulty relating to people who disagreed with him. Ronald Reagan. A lot different than, than I thought. I remember a conversation when I urged him to go to uh, Russia. He said, why? Because you will finally learn about Russia, but more importantly, they'll learn who you are and that you represent America. George H.W. Bush. I liked uh, President Bush. We, I have so many handwritten notes from him. Uh, so many times we sit around and the Oval Office just tell jokes. Uh, I'll tell just one. I know that's not doing rapid fire, but when I wrote the uh, organic farm bill, it was big like this, and He's signing, I'm standing behind him, he says, Pat, you read every word of this bill? I said, you're the one signing it. I've read about as much of it as you have. <laughs> and he just cracked up. Bill Clinton. I like Bill Clinton. We would sometimes argue. I mean, we, I remember one time we were just at each other. And Secret Service agent opened the door. He goes like this. And then... Three minutes later, we're telling jokes to each other, which fortunately the press wasn't there for those, and walked out with our arms around each other laughing our heads off. But I've, I've always liked uh, Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton. I felt very close to him. George W. Bush. George W. Bush, it was interesting getting to know him, but he told me that he knew of my friendship with his father, and so we, uh, we got along well.
even though we disagreed on things, when he nominated me to be uh, a delegate every year, there's two, every other year, there's two senators. I asked him when he signed his name on the commission, did his handshake. He said, hell no, anything to get you out of town. <laughs> Barack Obama. Uh, we became the best of friends almost immediately in the Senate. We trash talk each other in the Senate gym uh, and loved it. Our wives, very, very good friends. And I, I always felt that even if he disagreed with me, I'd sit down and talk to him. You also endorsed him at a key point in that first uh, in that first presidential race. Yeah, and when I told him, I, I been down scuba diving with Marcel, and I'd called him and told him I was going to endorse him. He said, well, thank you. He says to Marcel, tell him to wear a hat down there so he doesn't get that bald head uh, sunburned. I said, I think I'm going to call John McCain. <laughs> We're, we've got just a few minutes left. Donald Trump. Uh, I liked a number of Republican presidents because I felt they understood the Constitution and what the country meant and what they, how they had to lead. Donald Trump has only thought about himself. He's never once thought about the country. And finally, Joe Biden. Well, Joe and I were the two youngest members of the Senate when I was first there. We were the kids. We've been good friends ever since, and I'm delighted to see him down there. I don't think anybody else could have brought our allies together the way he did uh, with the war in Ukraine. Senator Patrick Leahy, thanks for your, your time, and congratulations on your new book, The Road Taken. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, listen to C-SPAN's podcast about books. Learn about the latest nonfiction books and best-selling authors. In each episode, we report on bestsellers lists and book reviews from around the country. You'll also hear authors talking about their latest books and insider interviews with nonfiction book publishing industry experts. 